Hey. Welcome. Glad you could make it. Um, so I was just walking around and thinking, why not make a class on digitally painting? Skillshare is always sending me these crazy emails all the time saying I can teach and that, you know, anybody can be a teacher. Well, I don't think they've ever met me because I can barely hold a sentence without getting distracted. This class is on digital painting. I wanted to make a class on digital painting because I need the money. No, no. Oh. Because I want to help you guys out and let you guys discover this this whole new medium of art. If you're an artist and you haven't given digital painting a shot, I I don't know. I really think I think you should. You should give it a shot because you, you're depriving the world of your talents by not seeing by not a god dang car. It's just freaking car. You loud ass. Put a muffler on digital painting! It's it's a great new medium of art. You can have all the different colors in the world at your disposal without running to the nearest Hobby Lobby to pick up some new white paint. Gosh, I am always running out of white paint. This is one of many benefits that I love about digital painting. So passionate about digital painting. I'm not that good at it. I'm not gonna pretend like I'm the best artist in the world here, but I feel like I can teach just the basics of what digitally painting is and how to get started if you're new to the idea. Come join me. Come on. Get in here. Get in this class. Um, be a part of the community. Uh, learn something. Maybe learn nothing and just teach me something new because I'm always learning. I'm trying to figure this this thing out. But I got a few techniques on, on what you can do. Uh, just starting out in digitally painting, such as setting up a Photoshop document, learning how to blend colors, using layers, using special effects to make your art pop, and just basic Photoshop 101 kind of uh, techniques for digital painters. We're just gonna have fun and I'm gonna try to teach you something along the way. That's all I'm gonna say here in the beginning. It's, I've been, you know, I'm like out of breath. I mean, it's your god dang phone! Will you shut up? I'm not that important. Never get texts. And now that I'm recording, now I'm getting so many freaking texts. Okay, so, um, I, I don't know what I'm saying. All right, join the class. I'll be, I'll be like it. All right, uh. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around and, you know, giving me a shot with this whole teaching thing. We're in for a roller coaster ride, I think. <laughs> Okay, so we're going to talk about tablets to start off because tablets is what makes digital painting possible. Without a tablet, it's it's going to be really hard because mice, 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 mouse, a mouse cannot capture pressure sensitivity. Here's your tablet, here's your stylus pen, you draw and you know lines appear and the harder you press, different variations can happen line weight the harder you press the thicker the line weight will be but if you if you try to do that with a mouse it, it's all going to be the same the same width the same thing with um the amount of pigment in the strokes so the the lighter i press the more of an opacity that i have and the the harder i press the more opaque all these uh different settings uh can be played around with in photoshop so that you can set it to to your personal style and preference of for whatever you're painting. Uh, what kind of tablet should you get? Uh, basically whatever your budget allows for, at the same time whatever your passion calls for. So if you're really wanting to get into this, you know, and you have the budget, then, you know, get go for a Cintiq. But if you don't have the budget and you're kind of on the fence of whether or not you want to try digital painting, go for something cheaper than this. This is a Wacom uh, into us pro medium and it, this this is pretty good for what I need definitely go with a cheaper one to start off It does give the same kind of experience as something like this, but a cheaper one would be just uh, your um, uh, What's it called a Wacom into us? I think without the pro at the end. I think you can get one of those uh, Get a small I would get a small for maybe less than a hundred bucks if not a hundred uh, bucks it, it, it can't be that much um, and those work out really good. I, that's, that's what I recommend. One thing I, I want to mention before we go to, on to the next portion of this. You might be wondering actually how, how does this actually work? How does, 
how does the pen know when to make a mark and how do I move my mouse cursor without making marks well it's very simple actually it just the tablet knows when the pins near it so you use you just hover around and that will move the mouse so you can move from different sections of your painting without like painting all over it and then when you actually press that's when it makes a mark when I didn't have a tablet and I didn't understand digital painting, that was kind of my question. Well, how does it how does it know? Um, and yeah, it's basically you hover and then you press when you put ink. It's very simple, very uh, intuitive. It's just dealing with Photoshop and getting used to all their tools and knowing what's all out there uh, could be the trickier part, which is why I'm here. And we're gonna get into more of that in the next portion of this class. So stick around. All right, guys. Hey, how's it going? Welcome back. Uh, so we're going to dive into Photoshop. So let's pretend that you went to Adobe, you downloaded Photoshop, you got it all installed, and this is the first time you're opening it. Let's, let's, okay, let's get into this. Um, this is, this is what it looks like when you open it up. This is the, uh, the current newest version, Photoshop CC 2015.20 million. I don't know what it's what they got going on right now but yeah it's all basically the same because basically on every version we're gonna go to file new because we want to start a new painting um now this is where it can get complicated and i will try my best actually it's not complicated i'm just gonna make it more complicated than it has to be because because that's just how my mind works but let me let me just try to keep it simple just keep it simple keep it simple stupid yeah name don't worry about it. I don't ever touch it. You know, we, we, we name it once once we decide we want to keep it. So right now we're, we're, we're just, do, don't worry about the name, okay? Document type. Um, you got a few selections here, but uh, I, I don't concern myself too much with it. But uh, if you want, US paper's a good, good place to start. If you have no idea about like pixels and all that. Um, what's good about paper is because it's it's an actual sheet of paper and it's set to a very high resolution. Well, for my computer, it's very high because it it can barely handle 300 DPI, um, which is which is okay by me because I I don't print most of my artwork. Uh, but if you do want to print your artwork and if you want to print it at eight and a half by eleven, document type U.S. paper, there you go. If you want it, you know, 11 by 17, just 11 by 17 and keep your resolution at 300 so that um, it prints well because that is the standard resolution size for printing. Like I said, this can slow down your computer a little bit um, and it can be hard and frustrating to draw when you're computer slow unless you're probably on a Mac or a better computer than mine but uh, we're gonna keep it at web resolution which is 72 DPI and we got to change this to pixels this is the measurement that computers work in a thousand over a thousand is a good one to start uh, if you need any bigger than that uh, you can certainly crop it uh, w once we get into the document let me let's just go ahead and open this size because I actually let's just let's do a standard 900 by uh, 1600 and okay so this is what we're working with here and what I like about um, working for screens the web is the size that you see is the size that you get when you're working for a print you got to actually view the document size to make sure that you're working on the correct size but this you know if we so down here down here at this uh, corner this is our percent that we're zoomed into um, right now we're at 50 percent and then I can zoom in again with uh, control plus or if you're you know if you're on Apple convert that to whatever the control is it's like Apple plus uh, option plus command plus whatever it is you guys know you guys are smart right I'm not that smart so I don't know okay so and then this is what a hundred percent looks like this is this is how big it will actually be um, and for me I don't care for this size so we're gonna hit C on our keyboard to change the size am I going too fast I'm sorry guys 
but this is this is basic stuff. But if you're new to it, it might not be so basic. So I, I should probably slow down just a little bit. I'm sorry. Okay, so C. Remember, we just hit C for crop, and then we're gonna click on the canvas, and then we can drag these points any direction we want to size it that way. And look in the corner there, it shows us how many pixels are within the height. So that's very handy. Um, let's just go with, you know, your a nice little Instagram photo because I like to design for Instagram. Um, and th they like squares. Currently, they, they, they can do more than just squares. So that, that's kind of cool too. But anyways, they like squares. Okay, so we just resized it. And I'm kind of jumping ahead. I'm jumping around a lot because I got ADD. So I, I hope yeah, you guys can catch up. But let's talk about uh, the the interface of everything. When you guys open up your Photoshop, you probably do not see this kind of setup. So let's go to the setup that you do normally see, which is Essentials, which it has. A bunch of stuff on here that like libraries who uses libraries actually it's kind of handy but don't don't worry about that these a, a lot of things when see this is the beauty of Photoshop is it's got so many things that you can do in it but when you're digitally painting you don't have to worry about like half that stuff that's what makes digitally painting so so inviting for for traditional artists because it's it tries to keep as much as of a traditional feel to it as it does as it can. Does that make sense? I don't know, but let's go to painting um, because that's the workflow that I like. And this is not the the default painting. So if if you click up here, it just kind of changes your layout. Um, and let me just bear with me just a second. Why while my computer decides what the hell's going on? Okay, I'm gonna reset painting. This is what yours will probably look like. And for the most part, this is fine. This, I mean, if, if you guys like it, this is fine. This isn't what I want um, because what I want is um, designed for my preferences. Um, and I, I recommend you um, kind of playing around with your own uh, kind of layout to, uh, to, to fit your own preference. So let's, let's uh, fix this up a bit and basically so here's a windows thing up here the tab um, and you click on it and you get all these different little boxes so this the swatches here this is like a window so if i went here to to channels oh look i already got it down here this is another window so that's what this whole tab is designed for for these little pop-up windows so let's say i accidentally delete my swatches and i'm like oh crap i want my swatches back well here it is right here it's no harm done it's all back it's all good but we don't want our swatches so let's get rid of it um we don't really need channels either um or paths um which you know these are all hidden anyways brush presets you may want to keep this if you like them at your disposal whenever you want but for me um right clicking i guess i should mention that with your tablet with your tap when you get a tablet you you have a um crap add man I'm just bouncing all over the place okay so let's go to wacom wacom when you install your drivers on your tablet uh, you'll you'll get like a properties um, box that you can mess around with um, and it's got all kinds of different functionalities and settings that you can get in here and play with I'm not gonna go too deep into this but just to give you an overview like you can change how how hard you want to press this tip field to firm you gotta press really hard in order it to get to its maximum um, maximum pressure sensitivity and then if you're soft all you got to be is very light and it gets all the way up there i i just keep mine at the default uh, because you know i'm i'm average just average um so yeah you got other things and this is right here as i was saying you can change these little hot keys on on your here right here um i got them both set to right click because i don't want this 
either one of these buttons accidentally pressing them and doing something else I don't want them to uh, but you guys can experiment with uh, what you want uh, there then you also got your function keys which I don't ever use them because um, I, I'm a keyboard guy I'm kind of old-fashioned like that I like to keep one hand on the keyboard and one hand on uh, with the stylus um, so that's just a basic overview and back to our brushes um, so I, I don't need this um, because right click when you're on the brush tool um, gives you all those options as well. Um, and if you're looking at this and thinking, oh, he's got he's got a bunch of different stuff going on on, on here than, than what's on mine. Well, uh, that's because I, I've downloaded a few brushes and you can find brushes all all online. Just Google Photoshop painting brushes or, or charcoal brushes or... or or whatnot um, but basically we're not gonna go too far into the brushes um, for this we're, we're let's I'm gonna try to stick to uh, the the basic hard and soft brush um, just so that we're all on the same um, playing field we got to get back on focus so windows windows okay we I'm not gonna use the the brush presets navigator I like navigator not for navigating which you you can certainly do um, just drag it around um, as you please but I like it for its size it's relatively small it shows me exactly what's on my canvas at a smaller size and basically I can see my my painting as a thumbnail and if it can read as a thumbnail then that means I'm doing a good job that's just the thing right if you can read it from a far distance you can read it up close and your your concepts working basically so is I know when I look at that navigator and I can see what's going on I'm in the right direction so I like to have that up um, all the time so as you see I just drag that window out and you can place those in between or under other elements so you can see where this blue line pops up where it wants to snap um, I like my navigator here on the left side right by my tools but you guys can keep it over here on the right if you want but I like it here on the left because I like to have uh, my layers uh, all on its own section alright so we are missing one other thing that I like to keep up at all times and that is my color so we're gonna go here to our window and we're going to click on color and there it is it put it right there next beside my navigator which I do not like um, so I'm gonna have it below it and then I'm gonna just drag it up by clicking here in the middle just a bit and then we're gonna we're gonna pull it out just a little bit too so now I have all this color if by any chance that it did not pop up as the hue hue maybe it it did pop up as your uh, HSB which is your hue saturation and uh, brightness um, which this this works too you got you do have this little drop down menu um, for a different um, layout of of ways that you want to choose your colors if you'd rather have your uh, red green blue layout which I don't know some of this it doesn't make sense to me so <laughs> grayscale is all right though pretty basic maybe no actually hue cube all the way I like I like this it makes it simple because you have all your colors here on the right all your different hues and then at the top is your brightness up and down your brighter you are the down your the darker and then left to right the less saturated and then on on the left the less saturated and on the right the more saturated it is it's just this is the most uh, convenient way to uh, to mess with the color I think well so let's get started with those here's your toolbar um, and as I mentioned before you can get to uh, that let's say you accidentally delete this you go to window and then you go to tools which is right down here at the bottom and you can change the different uh, layout, but I, I just keep it at at this straight here on the left. So 
this is your your move tool um so oh so add kicking in let me just try layers for a second this is our background layer it's the default layer it usually comes locked but if you just double click on it which when you open it up it'll work when you double click on it it'll unlock it um and then you can draw on it but don't draw on the back background layer draw on a new layer that way you don't have a white background um so now i can draw on this new layer and i can get rid of it as i please and i can also use the move tool to move it around so isn't that neat now if i want to do another layer you see how i can keep these layers separate um which is pretty neat and then the background layers uh, another one um if you're wondering what these this checkered pattern means that means uh it's a transparent background uh there's nothing behind it the the marquee tool the lasso tool you, these things you don't really use a lot when you're digitally painting but you can if if you're that advanced but you don't need to because this is getting more into the the fun digital side of digitally painting and treating it less of a traditional which if you're new to this you may not be ready for um but so i'll just do a quick overview a, a marquee um tool is basically if you hold down on it you can change it to ellipse as well um, but we'll keep it as rectangle. You draw your rectangle on and then you switch to move and then basically whatever layer you're on, since I'm on the green layer, I can move a chunk of that around. So let's say that you had a face that you had drawn. You just bear with me here for a second. Let's say that this was my face and that eye is just terrible i need to move it up a bit i need to move those eyes closer actually no i need to move them down so what i'm going to do is select those and then hit v v is our hotkey for our move tool and then we're gonna just use the arrow keys to go down a bit or i could just use the move tool and let's say that that looks so much better at that position and there we go now we're stuck with like these marching ants right here how do we get rid of that um control d or whatever it is on mac you guys got it um and then you got this white gap which if you're digitally painting you know how to get rid of that there now he looks so much better with that placement so that that may be um one situation where you want to use the 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 marquee tool um and i think i I think I used the lasso tool, didn't I? <laughs> but that, so basically the same concept, crap, sorry, sorry guys. That was the lasso tool, that was with the hotkey L. Um, and if you guys ever forget, you can just hover over them and you can see that that popped up L, marquee is an M, move tool is a V, I know. So, but V is, yeah. Um, but with the lasso, it's pretty much the same thing as your, uh, your rectangular marquee it's just um, you can draw whatever instead of just keeping it as a circle or a square and yeah that's how some people ended up like in Photoshop they take a picture of a person and move it into a different environment or, or something that's 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 how it's done it's basically the, that or the pen tool but we're not gonna get into that Something else that I'm going to throw in here about the marquee and lasso tool is that using these methods of selection is a great way for controlling exactly where you want to place color. So I can use this marquee tool on a new layer. So grab our brush tool here real quick and draw around it and you can see how it creates a nice sharp edge there on at the top there at the, at the marquee. So uh, this this really comes in handy for 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 actually for a lot of your digital paintings. So let's say that I wanted a complete circle and I wanted to add you know a little bit of a, a highlight here on the edge without um, blending. So if I if I just did it like that without the marquee, then it it's going outside the edges. But if I had that selection, I can do it like that. So that's another 
uh, good little method for using these selections tools. And you can also, you know, draw your own, uh, obviously, and then control where you want those uh, colors to be. Okay, so, and then you got uh, another method of selecting. This is all, like, these three tools are just ways to, to, to select things that, that aren't a part of its own layer. Uh, that you need to separate it from. Does that make sense? I have no idea if that even makes sense. But anyway, so here's the quick selection tool and then you 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 do that and you can move the whole piece that way. As you can see, I'm working on the same layer as the green layer, so I couldn't do that if I just was trying to move the layer on its own. I hope that made sense. I feel like I'm all over the place. So crop tool, we, we already uh, learned that, didn't we? I think we did. Uh, <laughs> but that, yeah, you guys know how to use the crop tool already. Just hit C and then drag it around, or then you can just hit that button. Hit escape to undo what you just did, um, just in case you want to get rid of that. Or hit, um, what, enter to, to confirm that size. Eyedropper, great tool. You guys know what an eyedropper does. Uh, basically, you just click anywhere on the screen. Um, and then you get you get that color over here. Here's green. Oh, I know that it's that color green. I can switch over to my brush. There we go. Um, a hotkey, which is something that I use all the time. I use the eyedropper constantly, but when I have my brush selected, which is B, hotkey. Remember these hotkeys, people. This this is how we uh, we do it. The most important one is Alt. I'm always using Alt. Um, with the brush tool selected. Remember, with the brush tool selected, you hold Alt, you have your eyedropper. And when digitally painting, this is more important than you guys may realize at first because selecting colors is a great way to speed up the process instead of going over here and selecting the right hues. Basically, when you have ambient light and all that uh, bounce light and everything. I'm not going to get too technical in painting, but you use a lot of the similar colors, so you want to use um, the eyedropper tool once you have a good base of uh, colors already on the canvas. That way you don't have to keep selecting. Okay, um, let's talk about another hotkey. Let's take a break from the tools a bit because, you know, I got ADD. I got to bounce ev everywhere. I I'm Done saying I have ADD. I'm not bragging about it anymore. All right, so control, uh, control alt Z is an undo. You see all those brush strokes starting to disappear? If you want to stay traditional, you can use the eraser tool or you can paint over it. But if you want to take advantage of the digital world, uh, control Z is a great way to, uh, to do some undos. Oh, I made a mistake, control Z gone and that basically uses your your history and just keeps going back in time to a different point so you can use this and go to, uh that way so i hardly ever use this um but it does have its uh advantages oh i got all my brushes out here as you can see like here with the marquee if i hold down it has got these in here but usually i'll find these brushes underneath my my brush tool which is weird that they're all below that but oh well <laughs> uh, so if you guys don't see these brushes uh, the pencil tool the the mixer tool and everything um check your brush tool and hold on it and you might see that mixer tool okay so it's a new tool that allows you to to mix colors which uh we'll get more into later but basically yeah it it helps blend blend colors together, which you can really do with the brush tool. So, um, but if you want to to get into that, that's not a bad tool. Stamp tool, gradient. Okay, I'm gonna skip a few because they're not too important for digitally painting. Um, but your eraser tool right here, standard stuff. Gradient, great great tool right here. You can use it. To make gradients as such which is a transition of one color to the next and if you go up here to the top 
in this box here. You just click on it. You can change using these default presets or your own. You can change the transparency of one color and the colors and hues themselves. <clears throat> so let's just click on this red and green because why not? Beautiful, right? Uh, so now that I got the red and green selected, which actually my transparency on both of them are pretty low and that is because I have some weird stuff going on up here. Okay, <laughs> my opacity was set to, to 50, 46, so I just moved that up. So you can uh, change the different opacity of these, but there you go. Look, that's, that's, uh, that's what the gradient tool does, which a lot of times the most useful way that I use it is I like to have a a transparency on one end that way I can use it as more of a shadow kind of uh, gradient or a vignette maybe if I if I decide to go that route on a painting uh, so that's your uh, linear gradient I think that's what it's called yeah and then you have uh, your radial gradient which is just like a circular one <clears throat> and you can change the opacity if you think that's too harsh so you have more subtle effects. And this is this is not an accurate representation of, of the power that the, this tool can use. Okay, so we got a picture of the Mona Lisa here. Um, and let's say that for some reason there's something wrong with this picture, which there's nothing wrong with this picture. It's perfect. <coughs> but let's just say that this area is a little too bright, so and if we were painting this, we could grab our gradient tool, grab our dark um, gradient here. I like to choose this default because it already automatically has uh, the transparency added to one of the color selections. Um, so we'll grab that. We'll change this opacity up a bit so we can actually see what we're doing. Go to the new layer so we don't affect it. And then look at that and that's green so we don't want that uh, let's see uh, we'll we'll just use one of these shadows which is kind of a reddish uh, pinkish purplish dark really saturated shadow so um, let's uh, try that again and that's with the the radial uh, radial gradient which is very nice um, tool and there you have it that's what a gradient can do much tool uh, they uh, is not a bad tool either I have not used it in a long time because uh, I overused it at one time and I was like this is this is ruining all my paintings uh, but it does have um, some some of a benefit um, it, it can help some, I'm sure, somewhere. Basically, it it smudges things. You can move things around, um, and it blurs the crap out of them and can, can, can destroy it. Um, but let's say, like, I needed this, this shadow right here by her lip to be just a little bit subtler and kind of go and blend in there a bit, which it didn't because, no, it looks bad. <laughs> but if I want it to, to move that around, a bit and blur it and destroy it I can if I want to which I don't so <laughs> that's the that's the smudge tool um, and then the rest of these tools um, not important uh, this tool the shape tool we'll be getting into um, and some of the benefits that that can do with uh, setting up perspective but that would be in the later on um, but that's a basic overview of the tools. Last section, a lot of, lot of stuff happened. Learned a lot, but I'm gonna try to, try to keep my cool going forward. We're gonna start, you know, keeping it simple. Try to learn one thing at a time. And this one, we're gonna learn about blending and I said one thing, but I'm already going against that rule. And these tools up here, um, we're, we're gonna be using our brush tool 
uh, because that's the most important tool that we'll ever use in digital painting. Um, and then uh, we're gonna blend two colors. Let's go ahead and let's go ahead and get some colors. Let's have a little bit of fun here. Um, so let's let's grab us a nice blue and an orange. All right, and now we're gonna blend those two because essentially this is what separates the mouse from the tablet. This is this, because we can blend and. In order to paint, you you must be able to know how to do this. So uh, let's let's get into that. In order to get into that, let's let's cover some of these tools up here at the top first. Opacity uh, might be self-explanatory, but let's go into it. Basically, at a hundred percent, you can get a full opaque color, and this is messing with just your brush strokes. So if I want to go to 61% for some reason, um, I'm going to apply some paint at the fullest pressure. Like I'm pressing down really hard and you can see that that's not the same color uh, because there's there's some transparency in there. Now remember that's just with the brush, brush strokes. We also got opacity settings for here and that controls the layer. Remember this is this is everything on that layer. So we can control the opacity there as well. Well, let's just turn that back up to 100%. And we're going to turn this up to 100%. All right, so I think we got opacity down. Let's go to flow. So flow is uh, a little different at 16% here. Um, it is the amount of pigment that's applied uh, with each pass that you go at it and I don't think that makes sense So let me just uh, Show you so I, I go one pass at 16% I go another pass and I go over it and over and over and over and it gets more and more opaque over over the the amount of uh, Passes that I give it so with opacity. Let's let's try to do that with opacity at 16% See or 12, you know 12% I go over it over 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 and it stays one one color one op uh, opaqueness um, it's only until I lift my pen up and then go over it again that another layer is being formed so as you get more and more advanced at digitally painting you'll play around with these settings and determine what's best for for you and your particular uh, style of painting. But let me uh, continue onward with uh, some more of these tools. So this tool uses your pressure sensitivity uh, to determine the opacity. So if I go if I press really light, it's very light. And if I press really hard, I don't even have to lift up. Um, it, it gets more opaque. So like that light dark soft heart airbrush is kind of like an airbrush if if you airbrush over a t-shirt or whatever you make a design um, the more you hold it in one spot the the more saturated it's gonna get over time so time is is our main uh, factor here with the uh, airbrush you see how it's building up with without me even changing my the pressure at all on the stylus um, that's what airbrushing is so you stay in one spot more it builds and builds so that's airbrush let's change this back to our hard brush and this one is uh, the size of based on your pressure so lightly you get a soft or a thin line weight and then hard you get a hard line you can see that there okay so now we got the basics of those tools down so let's get into blending I'm gonna just turn on this one here which is controlling my opacity and bring my brush down I'm still using a hard brush and if you right click you can get your brush a list of your brushes here and you can change the hardness of our brush so the softer it is the less um, the, the smoother the edges are 
and quite frankly the easier it is to blend but sometimes that looks a little too blurry um, I'm just gonna keep it at a hundred just to show that it is possible to blend with hard edges and yeah so let's uh, begin this this is how you blend in Photoshop well this is one way to blend in Photoshop so we start with our blue and we're gonna just lightly you know we're using our pressure sensitivity here so we're gonna lightly go to the middle and we're gonna kind of do that a few times and then we're gonna do the same thing with the yellow we're gonna we're gonna hit alt to sample the yellow and then we're gonna lightly pull that in to the middle and we're gonna do that again and again again okay so then once we get a color in the middle we're gonna uh, select that color now and then kind of blend that into the edges as well so it's it's a pretty much just eye dropping your colors and then pushing them into the colors around them does that make sense I hope that makes sense for me it's fairly basic but maybe it doesn't make that much sense is there anything that I can say to so it does make more sense? So I'm taking the blue, eye dropping it, bringing it into the middle lightly. And I'm eye dropping, I'm it's just over and over again. Eye drop, add some pigment, I drop the in between, add some ink, I drop this color here in between and then push that back and then same thing for the yellow now here in the middle it, it's sometimes when you have a gradient from one extreme to another um, it does get kind of gray so I like to especially with skin tones is add more saturation uh, there in the middle because usually with skin you, your, your lighter color is less saturated and your darker colors is less saturated than that and then the in-between is where the most saturation is so you can always add more color and then blend that as well and that makes for an interesting uh, makes it a little bit more interesting and that's with a hard brush if you uh, Photoshop does have some default brushes they do have like a I think a charcoal brush this might be one of their brushes I can't remember if I downloaded this or not and that's just another way to um, to blend as well that way you can have more of a, a charcoal-y uh, texture and that's that's blending folks now there is another method um, it's a there's a newer method with um, with the Photoshop CC I think this is a new tool and it's the mixer brush which is this this button right here this one right here uh, which could be embedded in the uh, the brush one like I mentioned earlier so if you don't see it right here click and hold on your brush tool and it might pop out and then you'll see it there uh, and basically what that does is you can you can smooth up the edges a little bit more by just um, doing it like so so instead of constantly uh, using the brush tool to uh, to blend and then alt and select you can use this tool to to blend it as well by just smudging the edges now I haven't used this tool a lot so I don't really understand it too much but it it definitely does get the job done I mean look at that let's go ahead and smooth this one up like I said you can definitely do this with the with the brush tool and using the, the technique that I just showed um, and with a softer brush it, it it does make much smoother uh, smoother um, blends so if I did want to do a smooth one do this and this and you can see how that makes the blending process a lot 
a lot easier, but it can make your, your paintings really blurry as well and less defined. So you know, this is good for maybe like skin tones, but if you you can't really get a hard edge with these and in paintings, hard edges and are everywhere, just like soft edges, I think. <laughs> so that's blending. Hey guys, you still with me? How's it going? Be doing rulers and guides, and I promise this one's gonna be fairly simple. So to pull up your rulers, well, to toggle between pulling up your rollers uh, is Control R, and that that pulls it up. So I can see that this is roughly a thousand pixels wide and around six six hundred um, height. That that's my rulers. If I right click on that, I can convert it over to inches and see. Um, hey, that's fourteen inches by almost nine inches. But if I Remember, that's in 72 DPI. Okay, so now let's get into guides. If you click on the ruler area, click and hold, and then pull down, it will grab a guide, and you can pull out as many as you need and place those wherever you'd like um, in order to help your painting. Um, so for example, let's say you, instead of drawing your horizon line, you can just simply use a guide and say, hey, that's, that's where all my uh, mines are gonna go towards. The only problem to having a guide when drawing is your your brush will want to snap to the guy, making it very difficult to, to draw around the line. Um, but you can turn that off if you go to view, snap to, and then turn uh, click on guides, and that, that will turn that off. Not snapping to it at all. So if you want to draw with it on, you can do so, but I usually just hide it and that will deactivate it as well. And to hide it, you hit Control H. So Control H to bring it back and to hide it. Next trick I wanna show you is a easy way to find the rule of thirds. And what I mean is, you guys probably heard of the rule of thirds. It's basically the idea to, to help make your compositions a little bit more interesting, I guess. And that is by dividing up your, your paper into thirds and it, if you want to draw a straight line hold shift while drawing but the idea is to put like a character on one of those points or you know the main focal point on one of those points and that that would make it more interesting and it's I think it's pretty much just to try to teach you hey don't put your focal points close to the edge um, because yeah, put them on one of these points and they'll look really good. But where is the rule of third? Like, where's the exact like points at? I mean, I could guess there, and th that does okay. But what if I want to be exact? In the newer Photoshop's, um, they have new guide layout, which is an amazing tool that automatically places guides on here based on the, how many columns and rows that you want. And you can uh, identify the gutter and all that as well. But for this one, to find the rule of thirds, all you gotta do is three and three. And you can see, here's our point, 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 point. You know, I, I usually, if I do it this way, I get rid of these extra lines around the canvas because we don't need those. And to get rid of those, you just pull them back to where you got them. So that's one way to do it, but there is another way that I like to do it as well. And that is, if you hit the crop key, which is C, and then you click on it, look at that. It automatically tells you where the rule of thirds is based on where you're cropping. So if I wanted to change, I can see, oh, this is where my new rule uh, point would be which is really handy. 
But I, I just pull it up briefly and then I draw a line out onto those points. So that's uh, another easy way to, to handle that. All right, so that's just a little quick tip there uh, and maybe it'll come in handy for you. All right, guys, let's get into some of the effects and filters that that we can do. And before we get started, I want to mention not to be too overwhelmed about all the different possibilities with these special effects, because there are limitless amount of things that you can learn from this. And it's it's really just the icing on top of the cake and not to get too carried away with some of these things and not to stress out about them. Uh, basically get down the fundamentals uh, first of just drawing and blending and you can slowly start to experiment with one of these uh, maybe one at a time so that you, you, you understand it. So, but let's get into some of the effects. And the effects can be handled two different ways, destructively or non-destructively. Um, and what I mean is, basically, if I go to Image, Adjustments, here we got all these different types of ways that we can edit our image. Um, so hues and saturations, we can change the, uh, the colors, the hues. We can change the saturations to more saturated, less saturated, and the brightness. Now if I hit OK, that image has been modified. I could undo it if I hit Control Z, but let's say that I didn't hit Control Z and I went ahead and like drew on it for a little bit more and decided, hey, I really don't like how much brightness is in here. Well, that that was a destructive thing that I did and I can't go back because I've already drew too much in my history. I can't go back as far. It's destructive, right? <laughs> Do you guys get it? Okay, good. So to, in order to avoid that, pretty much take that effect and it works as its own layer. So here, right here on this, this little icon right here, it's our adjustments um, layer thing. So, and there's like all those different effects that we saw over here in image adjustments, but they can all be applied as their own layer. So hue and saturation, there you have it. Same dialog blocks. And I decide, hey, I don't like that effect. I can turn it off or delete it. And we can even control the opacity of it. Say that that is a nice effect, but I don't like the, the strength of that. So we can turn the opacity down just a bit and say about, you know, 29%. Oh, that looks a lot better and that's more subtle. So that's one, that's one of many effects. Um, some of the other common ones that I use is levels and that's the contrast pretty much um, if you take this is your blacks this is your midtones and then this is your highlights you can see by the scale of here I have a lot of black in this painting it's it's a problem I know I'd paint too dark <laughs> uh, but but if I wanted to add more highlights into it I could take this brightness and bring it up and you can see that the image is getting brighter and as before I say I can change the opacity lower if I feel like that's too harsh so it's you can play around with it a lot that's why I recommend this method because it works non-destructively and you can always go back by turning the layers on and off you can change the midtones as well with that and the darkness, of course. One thing, as I mentioned earlier, I, I, I have a problem with painting too dark and I've realized that this tool, the levels and curves, because curves is similar to this, um, can be addicting because you, like, I mess with this midtone a lot and I usually drag it to the right because I think, 
oh, that looks really cool because there's more contrast right there. Like, and then I turn it on and off, and it's like, look how much bolder that looks. And But then, if I apply that again, if I keep on going more, I'm like, oh, wow, that's even more bold. But then, it's like this weird way of just seeing it like this, like, as it as it's progressing. It's like, that's too dark, and I don't even realize it's happening. So... Just what I'm trying to get at is be careful and don't add too much contrast in your paintings and don't overdo these effects because they they can destroy all your hard work because if I turn this down all these little raindrops that I had over here you can't even see them anymore. See look at that they completely disappear and then yeah and <laughs> you start seeing these uh images on your different devices as you share them and you look at it on your phone and you're like wow that contrast was just too much too much too much so reading this um i think it's called a histogram uh is a good way of seeing how much black you actually got and and making sure that it's more balanced for me this was a night scene so i needed a little bit more black so it, it kind of works out okay and for the most part you guys can go in here and I recommend experimenting with this. Uh, you can do brightness and contrast this way as well. Um, and if you don't want to use the levels. Um, vibrance, you can bump up vibrance and saturation. Um, color lookups a neat one if it's it's just a selection of kind of like filter like film stock like might add a bunch of crazy stuff let me turn this off so you can see exactly what it's doing so that's that's just a filter you can scroll through a lot of these and see which one works best for for whatever piece you're working on horror blue look at that it's pretty neat all right so we talked about the adjustment layers we've talked about controlling the strengths of them with your opacity. Let's learn about the blending modes. I think that's what this is called. I, Sorry guys, I forgot. If that's wrong, that, that may be wrong. But um, this little drop down menu is like different ways that the different elements on that layer, because these are being applied to this layer, they they appear they affect the way that the color is blended to the layers below it. So let's let's see an example of this. If we go to color dodge, which is it pretty much is a way to brighten up all your different um, colors. And I'm not going to go too deep into this because it it really needs its own class, I think. <laughs> Um, but let's add, let's pick a yellow color. Now let's pick our red since we got plenty of reds there. Let's pick it bright. If we use a soft brush and apply that, you can see how it just really brightens up that picture. Whereas if it was just normal, it would go on top. But since I have a blending mode on it, specifically color dodge, it kind of it brightens it up like really harsh too so try not to get too overwhelmed with this with this effect because it can destroy your pictures as you can see but if you use it right then you can uh, it can be beneficial um, overlay is kind of a, another one that I use a lot which is little bit less of the, the effect that color dodge was doing but it's more saturated and color dodge is more kind of a brightness uh i guess screen is it makes things lighter which this is not a good example of it it pretty much removes all the black so if you have like a picture of a lens flare which i have some pictures of some lens flares by the way so let me grab one so here's a cheesy little lens flare that I've just dropped in here. 
And we're gonna put this up here. Now, I can use blending modes to make this more a part of the scene by using the screen blending mode because it removes all the black. Look at that. Isn't that neat? So since that removed all the black, I don't have to worry about making a selection and wasting a bunch of time with that. I'm going to bring up the hues and saturations by hitting Control u which is the instead of doing it as an adjustment layer. I'm doing it directly on the layer. I'm going to change the hue of it to more of a red uh, color so it kind of, it matches the, the scene a little bit more. And I don't like the way I don't like the way that looks at all. But you, you guys get the idea of what that screen effect is actually doing. That's cool and all. So what is some other things? Uh, we got blending modes, check. Adjustment layers, check. Um, you can combine blending modes and adjustment layers. So back with that vibrance one. If, you know, I could change that blending mode to an overlay. And then it does all kinds of weird things. So you can you can you're starting to see how all these things can be implemented together. Hopefully, if I'm doing my job, if I'm teaching this well enough, then then hopefully uh, that's what you guys can see. Um, those are adjustments. Let's go on to filters, which is a list of all kinds of different things. But I'm only going to mention the the really fun ones, the really important ones that you probably will be using, and that is the blur one. Uh, so. Let's just duplicate this image real quick. Um, if you duplicate, you're gonna hit Control J, the layer that you're on, and that duplicates it. So we got two of these now. Now, I am going to hit Filter, Blur, Gaussian Blur. I might be pronouncing that um, terribly, but yeah. And then you can change the blurness of the image. Reason why you want to do this is probably not to blur the whole entire image, but just portions of the image. So since we duplicated it, we can erase portions of that image. So we definitely don't want the faces to be blurred. But if the background's blurred, that would add more focus to our characters. I'm going to change the opacity to my eraser so the the harshness of my erasing isn't as strong. So it's a little bit more subtle. And this is a destructive way of erasing this image. Um, I will get into a non-destructive way of erasing this, but for our all intents and purposes of this section. I don't want to get into that because that's a whole different topic. We're just talking about effects right now. So that's a way you can blur. And you can see that kind of works in the favor for the rain. Not too bad. Okay. So there's also the opposite, which is sharpening. Oh, so I'm going to go ahead and merge these two images since I like that effect. In order to merge two layers, you're going to hit click on one layer and then hold shift and click on the other layer so they're both selected. And then you're going to right click on them both and then click merge layers. Awesome. Good job. All right. So <laughs> now the opposite of blurring is sharpening, which is a really nice uh, kind of final touch um, if if you're going for that more of an edgy feel, which this image could certainly uh, do that. It's usually the one that I pick is sharpen or smart sharp sharpen, but we're just going to hit sharpen and it automatically sharpens the image without adjusting it. So you can see as I toggle back and forth, by hitting Control Z from the before and after, that's what Control Z does. Remember, Control Shift Z or Control Alt Z. My bad. Uh, goes back, 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 back. But Control Z just toggles between the last um, adjustment that you did. So we're toggling back 
and you can see how that those raindrops really start to pop out. So that's that's really a nice effect to apply it at the end of your drawing. Those are really the two important ones. If you're just starting out, I'd say those are the really the only ones that you need to know right now. All right, guys, so uh, I hope that was intuitive for you guys, and I'll see you in the next one. Let's get into flipping the canvas. Um, flipping the canvas. This It looks like this. Dink, dink, dink. Okay, so pretty, pretty basic. Um, and the idea behind that is that when you flip the canvas, you get a different perspective of the, the painting, and uh, you can see flaws uh, with it and be able to to fix it by essentially having a fresh pair of eyes because the, the painting's been flipped um it's not something that comes with photoshop it's actually an action that you have to set up um an action is pretty much a hot key that you hit that does a series of things that you told it to do let's uh go to window and click on actions and that brings up our actions and there are some defaults here uh, which i i've never really got into um, I, I just used the one that I created, which is flipping the canvas. And I have the height key set to F5, but you guys can set it to whatever you want. Basically, the how you make a uh, height key to flip the canvas, um, this is going to be step by step, so follow along. First, start by creating a new folder, which will contain all the steps that you take in creating the, the, the flip canvas height key. So you create the folder and then just call it flip canvas or whatever you want to describe it. And then you hit new layer, this little icon right here beside the folder. And then, you know, that, that action, the name, I don't, I don't really know what to name that. So, but then you, um, you give it a hotkey that you want. Um, so let's say we want F8 or shift F8. I recommend just leaving these blank because you're going to be hitting it so often you don't want to be stretching your your fingers across the keyboard by hitting shift and then all the way to F8. That, that's a pretty far stretch if you're using one hand. Um, so I, if possible keep it at one key um, and then um, you don't have to worry about color. And then so after you get your hot key you hit record and now what the program's doing is is capturing everything that you do right now. So it's recording what the, the series of steps that, sh that it's going to take when you hit that key. So in order to flip the canvas, you go to edit, transform, flip horizontal, and then you hit stop. And there you go. If I hit F8 now it flips the canvas. That's as about as complicated as I want to get with setting up actions. The only action that I ever really use, but they can get more complicated um, if you so want, want them to be. <laughs> All right, so uh, definitely helps your painting process. And I recommend if you're going to be digitally painting, get you a flip canvas hotkey set up. So. All right, I'm going to show you an easy way to get a perspective grid uh, laid out on the canvas. And that is clicking over here on our shape tool. Um, for you, it may be the rectangle by default, um, but we're going to uh, choose polygon tool. And then we're going to go up here to the uh, number of sides. Well, first, let's click on the settings. We want to make sure that it's that the star is ticked and the indent sides by percent is 99 percent and then for the number of sides i usually try to just I just do something random um, but you want to have a lot and for me 40 seems to do the trick um, you can have more than that of course but this is the number of lines that are coming out of uh, this star. Now that we got the settings the way we need it, we're gonna draw our star. And we just click and hold and pull out like that. To change the color, 
which I like to do, you can go up here to fill and change it to maybe like an aqua. Just something so that you can see it. Now you can see that we have a nice, you can actually move that to the dead center, and you can see that we have a nice one point perspective grid. And since this is its own layer, we can turn that off and on. If you remember my illustration earlier of the kitten and dragon, I used a grid, uh, this technique of the, the polygon drawn this grid in order to get background and perspective for this. So that's one point perspective and then you can draw you another one or just simply duplicate this object, this shape, to get a two point perspective. So let's move that off to the side. And then to duplicate this, we can hit Control J to duplicate a layer or we can click and hold alt and click on the polygon itself and click and drag it across the screen you can hold shift so you go in a straight line as well and now we have a nice two-point perspective layout you can do the same thing again for three-point perspective. A great way to start a painting is in black and white. The reason why it's a good idea, especially if you're new, is because you're only focused on value, essentially light. And you're not worried about, do I have the hue right? Alright guys, I got my fairly rough little sketch of a, of a ball a sphere here down. So now we're going to go and add some color. The first thing that I may do when approaching the color stage of this drawing is I will add a new layer. <clears throat> change that layer's blending mode to overlay. Now let's say that we want this scene to be more red. So we pick our color and we can either draw on top of it like so. I pretty much want the whole layer to be red. Um, and a fast way to do that is to hit Alt backspace and that fills the whole entire layer with the swatch that you have over here so these swatches over here is your current color the front one is for alt backspace if I want to fill, fill the color with white since that's my secondary color I can hit control backspace if you hit X it toggles between those two colors and if you hit D it takes it back to default so that's one way to add color but I usually do not let this layer do all the work for me I will create a new layer and add in some more color so if I wanted some yellow in this highlight I would simply just add that in and blend it as needed Having the overlay layer is just a good base to get started from. It can do all the work for you if you, if that's the style you're going for, but for me I like to give that extra oomph that the overlay layer does not provide. Remember our effects that we talked about in one of the last sections? Well, if I want to add more saturation to this, I can go and click overlay over here this remember this is just affecting the brush not the layer itself so whatever I draw now with the color that I choose it's adding more saturation and blending it a little bit better than having it just on normal does 
So I like to give it a little bit of a touch of that and then kind of blend that in. But we could also do a different way and that's by adding in a gradient map. What a gradient map does is we go down here to our effects, we click on gradient map and then <clears throat> click on it. What it does is it applies this color, this purple color to your shadows and this yellow color to your brights. So what I can do here, say I don't want purple and yellow, but maybe blue and yellow. I can change this to a blue. And then this yellow, I'm gonna brighten that up a little bit more because it's a little too orange right now. And we can also change the blending mode from this, from normal to say overlay. That didn't do too much, uh, really, but let's try a different one. Let's try color. Color looks a little bit better. We could also add some more saturation as well. Oops. By hitting hues and then bump up the saturation. And once again, I would really just work with this as a base and work from it like that. And I'm looking at this and thinking it's a little too saturated, so I'm going to bring this down a bit starting here out here in the beginning um that's two ways that you can add in color to a black and white painting let's talk about thumbnails thumbnails is drawing really small so that you're focused just on the composition of your art piece and not the finer details of things if you have a good thumbnail then you have a good composition so that's thumbnails is a great place to start so let's let's do that let's basically uh, this is how you set it up and we're gonna be using clipping clipping mask to do that first of all you can work on a really small canvas say 200 something pixels by you know 100 something pixels um, so that's that's one way of doing a thumbnail is to draw on that that size but what I like to do is to draw on a larger canvas and then put the thumbnail in on the canvas by using our rectangle tool down here cross a rectangle and say that's that's my um, that's my canvas that I'll later use on a bigger scale if I so choose to um, let's change that to gray Now, as you can see, we're going to add us a third layer here, and if we draw on this, you can see that the lines go outside the box. Well, in order to keep these lines inside the box so that we're working directly on this thumbnail and nowhere else, we want to go over here to our layers, hold the Alt key right in between the rectangle and the layer that we're drawing on and this little icon where there's a square pointing below will appear and then you click and then that will make a clipping mask so now that everything that we draw is going to be on that layer and nowhere else then I would basically just draw you know a concept here and to see if it works and the idea with thumbnails is to really dish out a bunch of these so we would actually have more than just one rectangle. This is pretty much, you know, a, a playground where we just brain dump everything and anything that we think of. This is just a way to figure out what you want to spend the next few hours on uh, because this is a way for you to quickly get out some ideas 
You don't have to cherish your darlings, as they say, where you don't get so stuck on one idea and have to make that idea work. This, you get all the ideas out and choose the best one. And then you would just make clipping mask new layers for each one of them so that you have all these thumbnails to work with. So that's one way to do thumbnails. Another way could be for uh, doing s master studies. And basically that's where you just take a art piece that one of the greats did, you know, take your pick, Caravaggio, Michelangelo, Dolly. So I'm just gonna grab this Caravaggio masterpiece. And we're gonna scale that down very small. So that we're just looking at values and concept and everything in between that's not the details. And I'm going to go ahead and get rid of these squares because we can use this image as our base layer. Um, but we're definitely not going to use the same color. So we're just going to hit Control U and then convert the lightness all the way down to the black. And then I'm going to actually bring that back up just a little bit so it's gray. And now it's the same size, so I know that I don't have to worry about size as an issue. Now, <laughs> one way to actually do thumbnails is you're not supposed to select the color. Um, but if you're learning, if you're very new, do what you want. But I highly recommend that you try to figure out the colors uh, for yourself over here by just looking at them and then just double check to see, you know, along the lines of what, if you were close or not. That way you can get an idea of what types of colors to use and for your other projects. As I'm doing this, I want to just briefly mention, don't forget to flip your canvas to get different perspective. And um, I haven't mentioned too much about brushes. Um, like I said, you, you can play around with your brushes as much as uh, you need to to figure them out. But uh, for the most part, I've been using the hard brush. Uh, normally I would use a charcoal brush or, or some kind of other uh, painterly type of brush but this can be done with your hard brush and you can play around with your hardness so that you can make the brush more softer or harder depending on uh, what you're currently doing you know skin tones and shadows and stuff like that's really good if it's for a so softer brush but if you need the hard edge obviously uh, a harder brush is what you'll need um, and size is a, is a thing as well <laughs> so you can mess with the size here uh, but I I completely forgot about talking about size in one of the last sections. I should have mentioned this probably in the tools. Um, but I don't mess with size um, on this on this uh, pop out box because I use uh, my bracket keys. The back bracket and the front back bracket will increase and decrease your brush. Also, another way to do it is uh, if you hold Control and Alt and hold right click, you can go left to right to size it that way, and up and down to size the hardness. Super effective, super fast, super amazing uh, little shortcut there. When doing these thumbnails, try to stay at one, uh, 100%. Um, it can be tempting to, to go deeper in and try to get in some details but remember we're not we're not trying to get you know the perfect beard around Jesus's face here um, we just want to get the basic concept we want for our thumbnail to say hey there's three guys here and there's one guy that's pushing another guy's hand into his stomach um, or some, something close to that. As long as I can get three different guys here looking all in one direction, um, 
that that would be great and that's the, that's the purpose of thumbnails is to create a concept and to, to learn when you're doing these master studies it's it's learning it's getting mileage in so that you can have a uh, a wider library knowledge bank <laughs> to to pull th from when you're doing your own thing because if you just design based on what's in your head um it's very limited especially if you're new and you haven't done you know thumbnail studies i'm definitely a new artist if you guys haven't been able to tell um so i love doing these thumbnails in order to practice and to expand that bank of knowledge I feel like this image was a terrible one to show because it, for me it's it's very complex. I'm not gonna lie. There is a lot going on, but I loved Caravaggio. Uh, that's why I decided to do it, but I did not even pay attention to, to what I was getting myself into. Um, so yeah, when you're doing your own thumbnails, uh, don't, I, I recommend not choosing something so complex. Keep it simple i would keep like do some still life or uh unless you're you feel really confident and you really want to challenge but i don't recommend it if <laughs> if you want to give this one a shot too uh, go right ahead him wearing this this cloth and all these flaps it's so hard not to 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 start drawing in some of those details um but you really gotta try to just Squint your eyes and get the basic building blocks of of the forms and that's kind of what I'm doing now I felt like I was <laughs> See I'm teaching this stuff, but it's so hard for me to even uh, Practice it myself because I want to start drawing those details in um, But but don't don't do it. <laughs> it's not gonna do good until you get those basic uh, Structures out so kind of squint your eyes kind of pull back a bit and look at it from from a from a different perspective from a far out perspective and then you can actually see what it is you need to draw I mean I can't really see I can barely make out any of the flaps in, in the cloth from this point so that's that's about as much as I need in my own so what I'm doing now is I've I was working with a hard brush. I brought the hardness down just a bit um, so I can try to smooth out some of these uh, these details and try to get rid of some of these unnecessary brush strokes because a lot of the brush strokes right now are very distracting um, and, and makes the piece a lot more confusing than, than it needs to be. But I definitely don't want to start blending in this area because you can see that this is a really hard edge. So I don't want to take my soft brush across it because it's going to make a soft edge and I don't want that. I want to keep it uh, hard and crisp like it is over here. Um, Alright guys, so that's my thumbnail and that is, um, that's where I'm going to leave it at. The, the idea for me when doing these master studies is to to learn something from it and and for me I, I learned a lot while doing this 
I learned that this painting, at least the image of this painting, is a lot more saturated than I thought it would be, would have been. So yeah, that's, that's, so yeah, that's something that I can take to doing a different concept in the future. Um, so yeah, I'm going to leave it there. I, you know, looking at it, I definitely see some obvious flaws such as the, the very sketchiness of it. I mean, if, but if you take it back a bit, it, they kind of read the same and I feel okay about that because I feel like in the grand scheme of it all, I did get the mileage in, and that's what doing art and improving in anything is, is get that mileage in, get that practice in. Um, and I did learn about the saturation thing, so yeah. All right guys, so once you finish an art piece, you'll want to save it um, as probably a Photoshop file uh, with all your edited layers and whatnot. And you'll probably also want to export it as, say, a JPEG or a PNG so that you can share it on the web, maybe a PDF for print. So let's do all four of those. If you want to save it as a PSD, you hit File, Save As, or to bring this dial-up box, you can hit Control-Shift-S. And then once you've find the location of where you want to save it, name it, whatever, and then save. So that's pretty simple, right? And it's pretty much the same thing for JPEG and PNG. You just select the drop down menu from the save as type and select JPEG or PNG. You want to save it as a printable PDF. You can all, you can print JPEG, but it's just better for PDF. Don't ask me why, really. There's probably a good reason that I can't really elaborate on right now. I mean, look at it. It's dark in here. It's getting late. Let's wrap this shit up. You want to first convert it into CMYK because printers use CMYK. When you're painting, you want to use RGB because that's the colors um, on your screen. So we're going to go to image, mode, CMYK. It's just gonna say something that we're not gonna really read and then we're gonna click okay. Now it's in CMYK. It probably did dull the colors just a bit but that's that's the the price that you pay when when you print um you got different colors that you're using so it's going to alter it just a little bit ultimately this is not an accurate representation of what will be printed um you'll have to print it and then see what it looks like if it's too dark then you make those adjustments and then do another test print and so on it's just a little fyi there but anyway so now that it's converted to cmyk we go to File, Save As, and then drop down menu. We're gonna hit PDF. Now, when you're gonna save here, always click Save As Copy because it will overwrite your Photoshop document. I don't know why it does this and why um, it's the save as copy isn't automatically checked, but in my experience, when saving it as a Photoshop PDF, if this is not ticked and you've already converted over to CMYK and you flattened your layers and everything, um, or you did whatever you needed to do to get it to that final uh, print ready stage, have it as save as a copy and then, or, you know, name it to something different than what your Photoshop document is called. But just save as copy. And click OK, whatever that says. And then we're gonna click on high quality print. Or if you have a different printer with different settings, you can change those here. So this is where I always went wrong because I wanted to make the, the smallest PDF file formats as possible. Um, and I didn't want to give those layers to anybody else. Maybe if I'm going through some kind of uh, printing vendor, I don't want them to have to deal with large file sizes. So I uncheck 
preserve Photoshop editable capability. Now, if you do this, like I said, remember, make sure you have that save as copy or save it as a different name because this is this is what messes up everything if you don't do that. Uh, because if you try to open up your Photoshop document again, all that uh, information will be lost. Um, which if you're working in digital painting, you might not have that many layers, but if, if you did, you want to keep those safe. And then you just hit save PDF. And there you have it. That's how you export. Alright guys, welcome back. Um, and I'm going to show you how I made this little sketch here um, from, from start to finish. Because we've talked about blending, we've talked about the tools, we've talked about, you know, setting up actions. We've, we've talked about a lot of stuff today. So, but how does that all apply to from like start to finish and how do I go about creating this? What I'm going to do is just basically show you how I made this so you guys get a good idea of what it's like to digitally paint. So I got my Photoshop document here open, ready to go. The first step to that I usually take is, is the line work. I want to start kind of sketching out um, basically what, what it is I want to draw. Um, and I do this with a hard brush with a very small size for this particular canvas. Three pixels is uh, big enough for my line work. Um, and I'm just playing around here. So let me show you the actual line work I did. Uh, so this is just basically the idea that I had. I wanted some kind of uh, gas station kind of effect. And I knew that I wanted the lights to, to kind of be blaring out. So what I did was I went ahead and de like clearly defined my lights. Um, and I did that with the lasso tool. Um, with not the um, this one, but the, the polygon lasso. So if you hold down on the lasso tool for the, this one right here, and then just go down, you get the polygon lasso, and then you can draw it by straight lines from one point to the next. So I took the window, I drew out the windows, and the doors, um, and then I basically added a brighter light to those. Um, for these lights out here, and to figure out kind of like how they would lay on the ground, I had my perspective grid line. I had a two point perspective layout here. And you know, really, before I even had the line work out, I, I had these perspective lines. And you can see, actually, if I zoom out here, and I hit Control T, this is how big it is. This is how far out the, those uh, lines are. Let me get this. See, that's where it's at. And I just pushed it all the way to the side off the canvas because um, if I had it any closer, things would look a little distorted. So that that's really, this is really how I had it all set up. And then I started sketching my lines using the grids. I was pretty happy with that. And then I added the light. All right. Then I started painting. Started painting in some, let's remove these guys. I painted on a different layer because I didn't want my line work, you know, my my solid foundation um, to be affected by, by the extra paint that I'd be adding, the extra shadows and whatnot. Um, because, you know, if I was painting all that on one layer, it might have destroyed my line work and then I couldn't go back to to my foundation where I knew that this was working. I knew that I wanted to have a guy in the window smoking a cigarette as if like he was on break and uh, you know, he's taking one last hit before he has to go work his, you know, job that he hates. But this is like the last, that last second frozen in time where he's kind of at peace smoking his cigarette. That's the story that I had in my mind that I wanted to portray in this. And that's really, for me, the, the kind of art that I've been really interested in lately. Not to get too sidetracked, but I used to do a lot of realistic paintings uh, back in high school. That was fun and all, but if I, like, it's, 
it doesn't really say anything. Uh, just a really realistic glass <laughs> and rose just doesn't tell the viewer anything. They're not emotionally invested into it. Um, and I want to make people have some kind of emotional reaction when they look at my art. Um, I want, and to do that, I have to tell some sort of story. Um, not always, obviously not always. Art's subjective. You can, you know, just throw paint around and vomit on it and call that art. Um, and that's fine, but that that's not for me. I want to tell stories. Um, and I want to tell stories even if, even if this if it's sketchily. All right, so let's continue on. I kind of rambled there for a bit about art, but you guys are all artists, so I'm sure you guys don't mind. Yeah, I, I this was my basic line work for that figure, and it was a little rough, and then I eventually, eventually did get out the details, as you can see here. Um, you know, I had to keep playing around with it a bit. You can see uh, some... I was basically... I had several layers where I was working on this <laughs> particular figure because I I had to get him right. Um, you can see there's another figure here at the cash register. I wasn't too concerned about him and getting him right because he's not my focus. This guy is is the focus uh, that I want viewers to, to be looking at. So just kind of breaking him down to the basics, <laughs> building blocks of people. Um, and then, you know, I, I do eventually get to this point for all you uh, people that are able to keep up with all these hotkeys. Um, I don't even know if I've mentioned this, but you can turn layers on and off with these little uh, eyes. You just poke them and then they, they go away. What this hotkey does is it merges all the layers that you have turned on um, into one new layer. And this is a hotkey that I use all the time. Um, and you hit control. Alt Shift E on a Windows, and that that just brings everything to one new layer, and that's what I did for for my next step. I brought everything to one new layer, and I added a destructive uh, adjustment or effect on it, and that is uh, the levels. I kind of just bumped up the levels a bit by hitting control L or you can go to the image adjustments. We talked about this earlier. And then I kind of brought up the, the blacks a bit and the whites, but I'd still try to keep it kind of dull. I didn't want this black over here to reach the fullest jet black because you don't really see that a lot in, in real life. So here you can see the lights are kind of getting a little amped up um, and this is a good use of a soft brush what I did here let me turn this off and just kind of duplicate what I did if I take my hard brush I bring it all the way down and I bring it relatively large in size control alt right click and left left and right is your size or you can do it this way um, I bring it up and I put, I bring up the white and get some white ink. And then I kind of just softly kind of add in these little bright flares. So you can see this little effect. What I did next was I took its blending mode to color dodge. If you remember color dodge, it just it just amps up the light a lot. Um, you guys will know what I mean if you guys get in here and experiment with color dodge a lot. Um, and you can see the, uh, the before and after of what it's doing. If you're using color dodge with actual color, you can see it, it being applied much more dramatically than with just black and white. And then next I added an even more glare because I knew this painting, I was just really having fun with it and I was going above, like really extreme with these little flares um, and how I made those, these two right here, basically how I made those was I made one white 
shape right here. Just kind of fuzzy, blurry, blob. And then I went to filter, blur, motion blur. And then I, you can change the direction of this blur and the strength of that blur. Next is the fun part, adding color. Uh, for this particular one, I didn't use the color and overlay method that I mentioned. I used the gradient map method that I mentioned. And as you guys remember, we go down here to adjustments, and then we choose gradient map right there. And then you double click, double click on this little shape right here, and this pulls up your properties for that gradient. I started off with kind of a purple and yellow purple for the darks yellow for the for the uh, brights and I only have this set to 53% because I felt like 100% was just getting this kind of weird color that I wasn't happy with but I was happy with 58 but I knew it needed a little bit more so I applied another gradient map to it and this one was one of the presets actually um, this this one right here and I set that one to overlay because I, I felt like this needed just a little bit more color. Um, and so that's that's where this came in. And I brought that down to 53% as well. Um, because as you can see at 100, it's just way too much. So I felt like 53 was the effect that, or the uh, opacity that I wanted it at. Okay. You can see here I added some more bright lights uh, to the to the windows using that color dodge method. Uh, in this layer, I started painting some new elements on the inside. You know, like I said before, I used the gradient maps as just kind of a base to get started, and then I start picking up some new colors to to add in to help amp it up a bit. And that's that's basically what I did here. Uh, I started adding some elements on the inside to really sell that gas station kind of feel without getting too uh, detailed in it because like I said I just want the story of this guy smoking outside to be told. Um, added a vignette or duplicating all the layers into one new layer like I said control alt shift E darkening in it with let me show you guys how I did this actually. Control Shift Alt E merges everything that's on the screen into one new layer. And then I hit Control U to darken it. And then I erase the middle with a soft brush. So I brought my brush up really large and really soft. And then I started to erase. And this flow is set down pretty low, so let's bring that up. You can see that, see how that's adding like a, a darker edge. See the before and after. It's a vignette, I believe that's how you pronounce it. Um, but this this method is a destructive way of doing it. I knew that, I knew what I was doing, so I knew like, I was working really fast and sketchily, and so I wasn't really too concerned about destroying the painting because I. I knew the direction that I was going in and I felt confident in it. But if I didn't feel confident in adding this vignette, there is a different method of erasing. And this is by adding a layer mask. So this is a new technique. Uh, so prepare yourself uh, for new information. Sorry I didn't include this in the past. Okay. So we got our dark layer that we just added. Um, we hit control U and we brought down the lightness. Um, and that's all working destructively. We could have done the same thing by going to uh, hues and saturation and adding it in as a layer on itself. Okay. And you you see here where there's uh, on this gradient map where there's a square right here. Well, what is that? That is what's known as a layer mask. And we can add that to any layer here. And I'm going to show you what it does. With, by adding one to this darker layer that we just added. 
So you add a layer mask by clicking this button down here. It says add layer mask. Um, so we're gonna do that on the layer that we want it on. And then this is the representation of its transparency, maybe. <laughs> All right, <laughs> try to put this into words here. So white means that this whole layer is visible. We paint with black with a brush, not the eraser. So we're gonna switch over to our brush and we're gonna paint with black. When we paint black on this white layer, it starts to erase. You see that? That can erase the whole thing. If we paint it back to white, that makes things visible. Does that make sense? So that's one way to add a vignette in a non-destructive way. You can add in elements and erase elements and bring them back as you please. I hope that I hope that uh, clear clarifies things up there. With the last few steps, I just added in a little bit more details, but not too much, and then added in a filter sharpen sharpen effect onto the painting as you can see that bumps up the sharpness of it um, and I felt like that sharpness was a little too um, hard here at 100% so I brought it down to about 50 ish and that was how that particular painting was done